Good morning, everyone. I'm Tamina Kauzji, and this is Wachana English Edition, the talk show on Sina Daily that brings you a perspective on the political, social, as well as economic landscape in Malaysia, giving our international as well as English-speaking viewers insights. So today, it's all about women's representation, particularly in political leadership. Now, while this has indeed been steadily and incrementally increasing, however, deep-rooted gender biases. Discrimination and stereotypes persist even from women themselves. So today we aim to answer these essential questions: Aren't women capable in leadership positions, and aren't indeed women born to be leaders? I think uh, I think women is not born to be a leader, tau. So uh, yeah, women are not born to be a leader. A man are born to be a leader. So I think for human right. For women, right? I think semua patut ada uh, the the rights uh, because we are all human. In a politically frank teaser, Datuk Nurul Hidayah Ahmad Zahid said, "Women are not born to be a leader." The 23-second video went viral nationwide after social media users expressed confusion and anger towards her such statement. To that, Datuk Nurul defended her remarks on her Instagram, saying that there's no issue for women to become a member of parliament, an assemblyman, or even a company owner. She said her comments referred to top leadership positions such as the prime minister, chief minister, menteri besar, and others in the same rank. Join our panel of experts and our moderator Tamina Kausji on Saturday. As they discuss whether women are born to be leaders or not, live at 10 a.m. on sinadeli.my, sinaharian.com.my, and all sinadeli and sinaharian social media platforms, including YouTube. Right now, social media and influencer perspectives aside, let's look at the hard. Facts. Okay. Now, Grant Thornton's annual Women in Business report actually showed that Malaysia women currently hold 37% of senior leadership roles, the highest ever recorded despite the COVID-19 pandemic. Though that, of course, may have something to do with the glass cliff scenario. More on that later. But first and foremost, did you know that the ASEAN region has also been making strides when it comes to women in leadership? We actually have、um, risen in our numbers, 38% from 35% just in 2021. The report also revealed encouraging findings, which show that these days women in leadership in Malaysia are taking on roles such as chief finance officers, chief marketing officers, and also chief information officers. The fact remains: 36% of businesses in Malaysia actually do have female chief marketing officers, highest in ASEAN. So clearly, there is a little bit of a disconnect between certain perspectives and the lived reality of women in the workforce. However, though. The issue does get a lot deeper when it comes to political representation for women in Malaysia. Most of our stats are fairly abysmal at the moment. Fifteen percent of women only hold seats in the House of Representatives or Dewan Rakyat, which is just half of the universally accepted thirty percent bare minimum for substantial and transformative change. Now, the same scenario repeats in our current cabinet, whereby we only have. Five women holding ministerial portfolios. So, meanwhile, the overall increase in the participation of women parliamentarians is also rather scanty. On average, we see it inching up by a snail's pace, anywhere between one to four percent only in the general election. So, looking at where we are today and where we want to be, 30 percent representation-wise, it's going to take maybe even more than 25 to 30 years. Time that we do not have to slowly build up capacity. What we do need, perhaps, is some definitive、um, legislative policy making, which ensures a wider and larger female political participation. So, all of this data in mind, one last nugget before we launch into the very fiery discussion ahead is that, according to our election commission data from 2018, we actually discovered out of 687 total candidates. There were only 75 women standing for election in GE14. On that note, without further ado, let's welcome all our panelists for today's talk show. I have joining me in the studios academician in gender studies, Dr. Vilashni Somia, 
as well as Sabute Member of Parliament, Yang Barhormat Teresa Kok. Welcome to the studio. Thanks so much for having us. Wonderful. Yes, and online, we also have joining us Datuk Sri Dr. Wan Salim Penang Mufti, as well as Putri Wangsa State Assembly Person, Amira Aisha Abdul Aziz. Datuk Sri, Aisha, welcome to the show. Right, so let's get the discussion started. I would very quickly like to go through the entire panel, uh, beginning with Dr. Villa on your initial thoughts on women and leadership sparked by this week's discussion. You know, I think <clears throat> this conversation could not have come at a better time. I mean, it's always been relevant. necessary. It's always been relevant. It's always been there sort of knocking at our doors. And uh, in my opinion, if you were to ask me about women and leadership, um, it's incredibly necessary and about time, you know, that it needs to be enforced. Why be Teresa? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, uh, a member of parliament, you know, for, so all these, while well, all these years, that in five uh, decades, eh? yeah. not five decades, sorry, five terms in, uh, <laughs> in the parliament. So we have seen that, like now, uh, women's voice is actually uh, very powerful and strong or influential in the parliament yeah. because we have more numbers now. And most women would like to uh, always active, actively participate in the debates. So I would think that um, uh, being a woman uh, MP, I see that women can make good leaders. Wonderful. And Datuk Sri, your perspective on this week's um, leadership and women debate, very quickly. I think we're having some audio difficulties with Datuk Sri's audio. Let's perhaps move very quickly to Amira Aisha, and then we'll move back to Datuk Sri. Yeah. Well, I think in terms of women in leadership, um, it has been very clear that there's an urgent need for us um, to focus on increasing women in leadership, regardless of whatever sector, whether that is in terms of education, whether that is business, um, in particular politics, because uh, although, as YB Teresa rightfully pointed out, that there are more uh, women leaders in parliament right now, but it is nowhere near enough, especially if you want to have a proper reflection of the society, which is 49% of female population in Malaysia. Thank you so much for that, Amira Aisha. Uh, Datuk Sri, back to you. Could you please tell us your thoughts on the same? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yeah. we can. Uh, uh, I'll try to throw some uh, lights uh, during this uh, discussion on very important topic or issue that is uh, women leadership, eh? women leadership. Mm -hmm. I will give my personal views on this uh, issue, hoping uh, that uh, all who follow these uh, discussions uh, can differentiate uh, between uh, the personal view of mine uh, with uh, fatwa or Islamic legal decision which uh, normally uh, met uh, coll collectively in uh, our official meeting, uh, official meeting of the Patua uh, Committee. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much for that, Datuk Sri. Now, let's launch into the entire discussion per se. Uh, Dr. Villa, what is internalized misogyny? Because this term has actually come into the mm, common mm. perception and understanding of late. And how does it relate to women and leadership roles? Well, you know, <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, to begin with, let's sort of, <clears throat> excuse me, break down what misogyny essentially means, right? Misogyny is, um, uh, the most basic definition of it is a, a, a feeling of hatred towards women. And internalized misogyny is, um, the, the phenomenon in which women internalize that feeling. So you will have women sort of looking at other women and even themselves mm -hmm. with a feeling of um, hate on one hand, but also, you know, a feeling of, uh, you know, um, uh, viewing other women as not being equal to men, right? And so this would lead to much bigger conversations and issues of, um, say, competition amongst women, this sort of very toxic competition, feeling of competition that can exist, um, you know, um, body shaming, that's a very big issue that's going on. Um, sure. And, you know, the creation of uh, powerlessness amongst women, and that, that is also uneven in, 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 in many ways, but um, that leads to many other issues of the lack of self-confidence and so on and so forth. So when we do talk about internalized misogyny, 
we are talking about women essentially looking at themselves as inferior. It's a self-oppression. Mm -hmm. Well understood. And also to the fact that uh, feeling like there is a limitation to women and what we can actually achieve. Of course. Right. Now over to Datuk Sri. Uh, Datuk Sri, I would like to ask you, what has women's role in Islam been through history and even what we see today around the world? Uh, well, traditionally, Islamic law is seen prohibited uh, women from being heads of state. Several Muslim thinkers and scholars today are beginning to challenge this stance and asking for review. Uh, but they, uh, of course, uh, they are facing traditional, uh, 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 they are facing opposition, especially from uh, our traditional uh, quarters. But in, in reality today, there are several uh, Muslim countries which have had uh, women as leaders, including Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Indonesia. Uh, but uh, also in our countries, we have uh, uh, such as uh, uh, Tan, uh, 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 Tansri Rafida Aziz and uh, Datuk Sri Wan Aziza. So uh, they, uh, they have a uh, uh, in, they have uh, pr uh, proven their, capa uh, their capability uh, to lead the country and the society. So the most prominent Muslim uh, female leaders, uh, our former Prime Minister, uh, our uh, former pr um, Prime Minister of Pakistan, Benazir Bhutto, Indonesian uh, President Megawati, ex-President, Megawati Sukarno Putri, Bangladesh Prime Ministers Khalida Zia and Sheikh Hasina Wajid, uh, and uh, from President of uh, Mauritius, I think, uh, Amira Garib, and several others. So uh, I see, and uh, uh, to be known, that uh, Darul Ifta al Musriya, uh, an Islamic uh, uh, authority, or authoritative institute of fatwa in Egypt issued a fatwa or legal Islamic opinion uh, stating that female rulers and judges are allowed in Islam. All right. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Sri. Yeah. I think it's crystal clear now yeah. that certainly Islam does not hold back yeah. or frown upon any form of female leadership, political even. Now from there, YB Teresa, I'd like to ask you about the fact that women have proven to be very successful leaders, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic as heads of state, all the way from Sweden, uh, Finland, uh, you've even got uh, New Zealand as well as Taiwan, many global examples. But yeah. at the same time, why do you think such negative stereotypes persist against women in leadership roles? I think all this come back to what we learned, you know, when we were young, right? Uh, for example, I look at Nuru Hidayah's, uh, you know, the very candid, uh, you know, uh, what do you call that, interview. Uh, she was uh, caught at the, uh, by, by, the, by the journalist to answer something that she didn't prepare. So whatever she was told when since young, all this will naturally come out. Yeah. So it's very dangerous, you know, yeah. when you speak without to the camera without a script. So I remember that, you know, when I was um, half a century ago, when I was young, okay, uh, these are uh, the things that the seniors told us, my parents told us. For example, like uh, my mother would tell me that, um, you know, uh, you, you should be a teacher so mm -hmm. that you can take care of family and, uh, you know, and, and can work. And then I remember I went to a, a, a media organization to do my internship. So the uh, editor had told me, Ayah, you women, uh, don't bother about politics. Uh. W women, most important is to find good husbands. You know, to, uh, find good husbands. Uh, you know, and here uh, you are five terms later, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So that was, uh, you know, 40 years ago, 40 sure. years ago. So mm -hmm. now, uh, this kind of, uh, what do you call that, uh, teaching or yeah. thinking have been, uh, you know, perpetuated. Um, you know, generation to generation. They say there are still people who, uh, you know, think in that way, even young women. Mm -hmm. So I believe Nuru's uh, parents 
maybe told her the same thing. Right. Yeah, women, you know, just stay at home to find good husbands, take care of children. So when she was asked, you know, about women and leadership, very natural, she came up with that statement. Yeah. Then mm -hmm. after that, she tried to deny, but it's difficult to deny because this is ingrained in her thoughts. And yes, uh, but it's important to like move beyond that into actions as well. Thank you so much for that, YB Teresa. Now, I'd like to ask Amira Aisha, <coughs> have you experienced pushback as a young female assembly person? And what has that been like for you? Well, um, because my position not obviously as long as YB Teresa, uh, but in a very short time that I am, you know, have been elected, I think there are very um, you know, several moments in which people give me backhanded comments. They don't necessarily tell me that, oh, you can't serve us because you're a female, but there are those who say, uh, well, you are a woman, but it's okay, la. you just try and do your best. You know, so it's like uh, that, that, that thinking is there. Although they want to support you, they still feel that a woman cannot be uh, the person who leads the um, constituency. Uh, there are also comments because my team is largely made up of female. And so there are comments where people are telling me that you should get uh, more males into your team because then it will be easier for you to do uh, several jobs, which I think this kind of thinking is very dangerous because you can already see, for example, uh, in many, many sectors, like one of five women are being questioned in terms of their ability to carry out work simply because they're a female in comparison with their male counterparts. And I think all these things I have been facing, not just in politics, but even before this and ever since we were in school, um, there was always this understanding that um, no matter how good you are as a female, but when it comes to picking class monitor, for example, or head prefect, for example, when you're in a co-ed school, that position is sort of like inherently a male's position. And I think all these aspects in society need to be changed in order for us to empower women much better ever since they were young. Absolutely. Really good points over there, Maria Aisha. I also distinctly recall the manner in which, um, you know, girls who came from girls' schools generally yeah. took on leadership roles in university, etc., and were viewed as garang, so-called aggressive. But perhaps <laughs> it's just because they always had the opportunity to take on leadership roles right. all the way from school. Um, Dr. Villa, so what are some of the existing barriers to women's leadership that we still see more structurally in our society? Well, you know, before I head into that, I'm, I'm very appreciative of the way sure. that the conversation has sort of been directed because it's really it's propelled me back into my own personal uh, experiences of... Uh, I've chosen to be in academia from a very young age. Don't ask sure. me why. Okay, that's a conversation for another <laughs> no, time. No, glad to have but, you. <laughs> but from the moment I knew when I was at university, and I think it had a lot to do with the fact that I'm dyslexic, right? So for years, you sort of figure out how it is you're going to get through um, education. You, you, you ask yourself, uh, you know, because uh, to a certain extent, academic prowessness is also, you know, sort of linked. There's a kind of a, a, a belief that those who do, say, for example, sciences, or hard mathematics, right, or something like that, that uh, these are very masculine sort of, of things. So I was reminded when um, once I said, hey, you know, I kind of want to be a, a, an academic, a professional student. <laughs> Somebody actually said to me, like, oh, good, lah, you know, you, you, that's very good because then you have so much time for the children. And I, right. I, I didn't quite understand what that was being at 21, wanting to, well, you know, quote unquote, party uh, a, a little longer as a young 20 year old. But, you know, these are the things that I'm, I'm uh, I, I want to point towards. This is a patriarchal society. The insidious. Right? The insidious, yeah. It, it comes in all forms. Uh, particularly the subtle ones are the, most, are the strongest. Now, of course, on a larger level, we are looking at you know, gatekeepers that are predominantly male. Right? So when you want to enter a particularly male-dominated industry, you know, YB, you should yeah. have a lot yeah. to say about this. <laughs> you know, but there are other industries that are considered... Um, um, incredibly male-driven, especially in the top. If you want to be a corporate leader, for example. Let's say in oil and gas. Oil and gas, right? STEM. You want to work with the big boys in Google. You want to come up with technology um, in labs. These are male-dominated industries. You want to become somebody inside 
um, you've got to be, uh, you know, it's the boys club, right? And I'm quoting a, 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 the title of a film from a local Malaysian filmmaker who recently won in Busan, uh, Chen Yi Wen. So the point that I'm making is on, on that larger structural level, you're looking at that. But let's not forget that larger um, structural issues are supported by smaller everyday societal yeah. Uh, gatekeeping and this can come from women as well right there are mothers and sisters telling young girls who say i want to be a coder for example and they'll sure. ask well how is that going to support you and later on will your husband like that right is this going to be something that is going to support you in a in a female capacity and i think essentially this is what we're looking at we are creating these harder larger structures from these small everyday conversations as Amira has sort of put up. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's been such a great conversation. However, we will be moving into a short break. And after we're done with that, we will be back to the discussion on basically what are some of the broader challenges for achieving political equity and parity for women in Malaysia. Don't go anywhere. Anna Ibrahim, um, she's a, he is a sweet talker, you know. When you talk to him, there's always positive things and I find him sweet. <laughs> yeah, he is a sweet person. He is a sweet person. First of all, I, I really I maintain that my innocence of I have never uh, inflict any violence against the law enforcer. I know that they are just doing their work. Um, the important thing is uh, we have to be perseverant. We have to be um, Stand firm, regardless of whatever challenges. I'm the founder of Suri Lifestyle. Suri has been established since 2016 uh, until now. It's been almost uh, six years. We focus on uh, recycled denim. From that denim, we design, we come up with uh, product development and then to come up with a variety of craft, uh, handcraft. It was nothing like I expected. Uh, you really have to play with, like, you really have to control your your hands and your the movement. If you, if you don't control it well, you got to start all over. Welcome back. You're still watching Wachana English with me, Tamina Kauschi. Today, it's all about women and political representation in Malaysian society. Now, um, Dr. Villa, so of course, now that we are done with really breaking down some of the core issues behind what anchors such negative and sexist stereotypes, let's talk about the fact that female political representation mm. still remains fairly abysmally low. Right. Um, now, how does this actually impact broader social issues yeah. affecting women and girls which are actually um, constantly on rotation, and we keep looking at them as social ills. I'm talking, you know, teenage pregnancy, yeah. even a female a life cycle of poverty, and right. even criminality. Yeah, I mean, you've clearly named some very important issues here. Um, how do we count the ways, really, mm -hmm. right? Um, when we do look at, I think, societies that have a, a much better handle of their everyday issues, I think they are governed by one very, very important thought, women's issues are everybody's issues. They really are, right? Um, and even if you don't have daughters, you have wives, sisters, mothers, right? 
um, you are friends with women. You need to understand that a lot of the things that they sort of experience will impact uh, everybody's everyday reality. So, you know, when we are looking at women in um, uh, decision-making positions within the political sphere, if you don't have enough of their representation, they, they cause, you know, some immense issues that go on unanswered for years, if not decades, right? And I think the issue here is that we are also, we need to really consider here that, um, so I'm an anthropologist. And that means I, I work on, on, on communities, on, on, on um, everyday issues that communities in the fringes sort of experience. And I'm Sabahan. And I can tell you firsthand um, from the years of work that I've done with communities back home that when you don't have the right representation in power, you mm -hmm. overlook some massive issues. Period poverty, for example. How is anybody, you know, there are communities, there are women that when it comes to their monthly cycle, they don't have the necessary resources to help them with that, right? What about child marriages? These things happen so often in the fringes. We want to be respectful of religion and culture, and I get that. I'm respectful of that. But there still needs to be a conversation about the way in which you, you, you sort of move in a way to solve a huge crisis where you're marrying children off. And a part of that can really be solved when you bring women to the table to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Spot on, Dr. Villa. And arguably, it is only in the um, past, you know, perhaps 10 to 15 years when there have been slightly more female MPs, politicians, that these issues have actually been echoed and raised regularly. Why be Teresa? So um, tell us a little bit more and dig deeper on some of the challenges that you have personally faced as a woman in politics and have things become smoother or are they pretty much just as entrenched um, five terms ago compared to today in 2022? Oh yeah. Um, okay, number one is I think the challenges faced by women politicians in Malaysia are the same with men. Okay. Basically, in our country, everything you have to be very careful when you deal with race and religion. Of course. Okay, so that is one. Number two is that um, because of the issue, uh, you know, uh, on race and religion, sometimes when we uh, go to conservative area, for example, uh, maybe it's not so advisable for, uh, for for I to go alone. Okay, for me to go alone, or you know, certain uh, meetings, certain uh, functions, it might be good to be addressed, you know, participated by men mm -hmm. rather than women. You know, okay, Even you, though understand? you may be the representative for the lay. Uh, no, no, not so much in my kawasan, of course, not so much in my constituency. I'm just talking about in certain mm -hmm. uh, contexts. A more generalized. But, yeah, All generalized. Right. But there are also times where. You know, it's good for a woman to attend right. together with all sure. the Muslim You know, for example, in the kampong, they would love to have you there. They might not feel that comfortable if a man, you know, mm -hmm. appear. So anyway, I I would like to bring to attention on just how you mentioned about past. I remember when I was uh, when I became the uh, uh, MP for the first term. So it was after the reformasi, right? So the time uh, past was the Ketua Pembangkang, opposition leader in the parliament. And, but at that time, PAS was still having the stand that no women should contest in the election. So there was no mm. women parliamentarians. So in that first, my first term for the five, four to five years, it has become something for the, the other side, the APNO MPs to ridicule PAS for four to five years. So in the end, that party has no choice. The, the following uh, uh, general election, they have to fill in a few women candidates. Mm. So uh, you talk about challenges. Uh, without women, it can be very challenging for some political parties. So no matter how, you still need to fill in. You know, they were forced to fill in women candidates and justify it. Mm. That's very interesting. And thank you for you know arcing the history around it. Mombe, moving into Amira Aisha, uh, what challenges have you specifically mm. faced as a young woman in politics, Amira? Well, I think um, in order to understand the challenges of women in politics, it's just in general, politics itself is seen as a very much of like a gentleman's club of a sort. Um, throughout history, um, there has been a very significant involvement of obviously men in politics, but in terms of women, um, the progress of women in politics is very slow. Uh, gradually, I think. Uh, even in Pierre and Johor recently, for example, we have about 200 39 candidates and only 37 of them are female and this shows 
that um, although in many other sectors there is a huge increase of female participation in terms of leadership, but in <coughs> politics it is still very much behind. Um, it started even before when you know, even before you got elected. Um, for example, when you are in a party, for example, the more conservative party, um, you can see that when it comes to women, women are put uh, into a um, wing of its own. There's always a female wing, uh, all women's wing. And then <coughs> that is when involvement of women in terms of the top leadership uh, got a little bit um, hindered because you are, for example, you're seen as if you can only be um, taking the position of a leadership in terms of that particular wing itself. And when you when it comes to activities, for example, in, in a political party, because, you know, um, you always think of, for example, sports, there's always like football, there's always futsal, but for women to join into activities with other male counterparts is very limited. And so in order for you to, for example, propel more women leaders as candidates for election so that you have more female representation in the parliament or in the state assemblies, it is very important for you to relook back into the culture that is being practiced um, in your own political parties first and see whether or not the culture practiced in those political parties are a culture that is a friendly towards women, a culture that accommodate women. And I think that is very important when we're talking about having more women representation in politics. Absolutely. Thanks so much for that, Amira, especially speaking about the fact that it's quite cultural, not so much only just um, systemic. From there, um, Datuk Sri, I'd like to ask you from a faith-based perspective, why is it important to have more women in political leadership? Because that actually leads to broader social benefits. I have a very quick example to share with everyone, which is actually that um, affordable housing in Malaysia, specifically the PPRs, their design was only changed with specific house plans for more than two rooms inside the PPRs but during Dr. Sharizat Jalil's time. And before she came in, there was just no sensitization around it. Uh, Datuk Sri, over to you. Okay, uh, I am, uh, of course, uh, expected to give uh, Islamic kind of view on the issue. Uh, I would like to stress here that Islam cannot be held responsible for the deterioration of the status of Muslim women in the later period, simply because the occurrence of such a phenomenon has uh, not been the results of it, the implementation of its uh, doctrines. Uh, many Islamic school, uh, uh, Islamic social orders have been renounced by the, by the followers of Islam for a long time. Uh, the general backwardness of the Muslim world uh, uh, in recent centuries has affected almost all spheres of uh, their lives. Uh, since they are an uh, they are an organic uh, part of the uh, decadent uh, society, women are uh, certainly not uh, exceptional in uh, this uh, respect. Uh, while uh, when they, we see in the Quran, uh, it should be noted that uh, it uh, contains uh, verses that appear to support the role of women in uh, politics, such as uh, its uh, mention of the uh, Queen of Sheba, who represented a ruler who consulted with and made important decisions on behalf of her people. The Hadith also provides uh, numerous examples of women having public leadership uh, roles uh, the Prophet Muhammad's uh, first wife, for, for example, Khadija, was his uh, chief advisor uh, as well as uh, his first and foremost supporter. His young wife, Aisha binti Abu Bakr, a well-known authority in uh, medicine, history, and Islamic jurisprudence, often uh, accompanied the Prophet to battle, even uh, leading uh, many at the battle of uh, uh, she she leads uh, an army at battle of uh, camel. 
However, is uh, there is a hadith which uh, attributed to the Prophet, uh, to Prophet Muhammad, mentioning that he says that never will succeed such a nation as makes a woman their ruler. But uh, contemporary Muslim scholars have uh, cast doubt on the uh, authenticity of this uh, hadith. Uh, setting out of the first uh, release, it's a contradiction with the rest of the uh, Quran, and most uh, likely use uh, of the hadith for a specific person at the uh, time. Uh, that is to say, a queen of uh, Persia, uh, rather than a general rule or uh, advice. Of course, we have uh, to acknowledge that despite a modern uh, developments and uh, greater inclusion of Muslim women in political life, there are Muslims in certain quarters uh, who maintain that the ideal Muslim uh, woman should confine herself to the role of uh, mother and wife. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Sri. Some great insights over yeah. there. And at the same time, I'd also like to point out the fact that um, UAE, for example, actually has 50% female representation in politics. Um, from there, mm -hmm. moving into um, YB Teresa once again. Uh, YB Teresa, now women are much more than just maternal instincts alone, as you, of course, proved during your tenure as primary industries minister. Um, why do we need more women leaders in diverse ministries, especially looking at the kind of issues we have with um, climate crisis and food security, which are, of course, national issues? Oh, yeah, just like you mentioned about maternal instincts. So for a mother, uh, you always look at you. You you just need to look at your the uh, eyes of your kids, and you will know what they want, right? And uh, that is uh, the kind of alertness uh, that uh, or sensitivity uh, that we need when you become leaders. So you look at a mother. You, you have to make sure your your kids, your family members, have food to eat. They are living in a good environment. They are safe, and also you also play a role in resolving the uh, various problems in the family. And all this when you apply it in the nation or you and you're heading a ministry all this have become important um you have pointed correctly that you know when i was the minister of uh, primary industries a uh, lot of times when i went to uh, travel to overseas especially to western countries i argue with them over i, I talk to them over climate change because this is the topic that is uh, very close to their hearts so i link why palm oil is needed for it to feed the population of the world and how you know the palm oil industry in Malaysia, we uh, move, uh, we want to conduct our industry according to the need of environment and to battle against climate change, blah, blah, blah. So, um, to, and, and also food crisis. So I mentioned all this in my arguments when I travel abroad. So all this like is important because, you know, as a mother, you will look at your family members to make sure they have enough food to eat, they are safe, blah, blah, blah. And when you come to, the, uh, to be a country leader, you also look into the uh, expectation of the nation, of the population on this. So uh, basically, I would think that a lot of times, because women uh, tend to look into details, they are more sensitive, and this makes us, uh, you know, uh, can play good role in politics. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that's an excellent way to actually um, twist that around and saying that maternal instincts are perhaps something which even male politicians or more neutering side of their personalities, right. they need to develop. Uh, Dr. Villa, for you, I'd like to ask the fact that, of course, um, the new Australian cabinet that mm -hmm. has just been ushered in has almost 45% female representation right. in various diverse ministries, all the way from youth and sports, aging, to even the finance minister, yeah. who happens to be of Malaysian origin. Yeah. Uh, my Minority woman as well. Now, why is such representation, though, important for substantial reform for the whole of society? Well, you know, um, I'm not going to put down the efforts of uh, the Malaysian government, regardless of who it's been headed by sure, in of course not. the recent decade, right? I think, of course, there have been avenues where there are some 
um, uh, uh, what do you call some successes. Um, but you know, oftentimes when we sort of value and we take a look at these successes, they can be seen as number one, very peninsula centric or very urban centric, right? You're looking at you're 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 looking at things through the lens of uh, wanting to measure successes alone, and you know, in a sense, sort of riding on that for a little while. I learned a very long time ago that you can only be a, a group of people can only be as strong as your weakest link, right? Mm. And if you don't know what your weakest link is, then you'll never really know how strong you can be or you should be, right? And for me, I think when you think about the weakest link in the government um, in the country, and this is not to say that people are weak, but they're not afforded the same sort of resources, opportunities, right? They're not empowered in the way that they should be you are thinking about things like indigenous women living in, you know, the one of the poorest districts in the country, Pitas, for example, up in North Sabah, sure. or in a place like Lawas. Or what about disabled Indian women in the estates? If you're not looking and you, and, and, and you don't have representation, then oftentimes when we talk about women issues for the country, they continue to be big picture issues. What are we going to do? Uh, about the number of, say, girls who don't have the right, um, you know, um, the adequate amount of uh, support to go into a particular program versus what can we do for this one particular community of women who are suffering from X, Y, Z or who don't have the following things. These issues are often nuanced, mm -hmm. but we continue to have the conversation in a, in a sort of big picture method because we don't have enough women in... Um, policy making positions in decision making positions sort of um, bringing their experiences from different avenues of the country to say well this is how this differs from here and you know if you go in and you're data blind you're not going to be able to make the best policies in the long run so yes we celebrate our successes but we have to continue to think about what have we overlooked what have we not considered and this is a very important point to think about. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. A lot of food for thought right there with the fact that when we look at hyper-localization, which is ever more important in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, which just still continues on a recovery angle. And the fear is, of course, that we are actually enabling an entire, the creation of an entire underclass of underprivileged women and girls, adding on to those already existing intersectionally all across Malaysia. Uh, before we go into the next break, I'd just like to also highlight that things are, though, slowly changing. Um, one, fact, uh, one fact in point is actually that uh, Jakim has quite recently appointed its first female DG, Datuk Hakima Muhammad Yusuf. So how do we actually move on into um, making this um, something which goes into broader societal change? Time will tell. But we go into a quick break. We'll be back right after. Stay tuned. I think women is not born to be a leader tau. So, uh, yeah, women are not born to be a leader. A man are born to be a leader. So, I think for human right, for women right, I think semua patut ada uh, the, the right. Uh, because we are all human. I think that is uh, it's a min misconcept that uh, we will simply labour people as uh, we are this team and that team. I've been uh, the founding uh, leaders since uh, the party was formed in 1999. Uh, just like Azmin and Saifuddin, we were um, leaders together, we were comrades, and we worked together to build this party. Hi guys, this is Shahira from Sinar Daily. So for today's episode of Dazzle, I am here at Good Times DIY Pottery Studio at Paradigm Mall. I'm going to try to make some pottery. This is my first time. I don't know what to expect. I'm kind of nervous. Let's go. I'm going to try to do this. Denim uh, is one of the material that you cannot destroy at the landfill. You cannot burn burn it because it's involved on the environment because it takes uh, more than 100 years uh, to dispose 
at the landfill. In other way, you still have to uh, reuse back or you have to sell it back. In G14, we lost badly because the people uh, believed a certain quarter of politicians and now they have already seen from this side who is legit, who is consistent and who are with them. For example, 22 months of the Pakatan regime, whatever they have promised, most of it, they couldn't fulfill. Welcome back to Wachana English. You're still with me, Tamina Kausji. Right, so panelists, let's now move into the big question. Um, is Malaysia ready for a female prime minister? Wabi Teresa, what do you think? Well, if you look at the present uh, uh, political leadership of every political party, it seems that it is uh, not possible now. But I still remember that when uh, Dr. Sri Wan Aziza, when she was the uh, PKR head, uh, you, if you recall, some of my party leaders and even uh, people on the ground have been expecting a woman prime minister. Um, so, uh, as of now, uh, not yet, but we do not know. Things might change. Dr. Villa? I think it will happen. I think it's an eventuality. It's, it's, um, it's a situation in which I think you are also faced with an entire generation um, of uh, young Malaysians who are certainly a lot more vocal I think they are thinking about things in um, very different ways. I do echo uh, what uh, YB Teresa had just said, that it, it, it's not possible now simply because if you look at the math, you don't have the numbers. You, you need to sort of, you, you need more. And I think this is why we're constantly talking about the 30% quota, right? And mm -hmm. personally, it really should just be a 50% quota. It really should be that. But Absolutely. I, I recognize that, you know, it's one thing to get to a point where at least if we can get there, we can push further. But, you know, it's, for me, it's an eventuality. I hope to see it in the time that I'm still alive and walking on this earth, certainly. But so there are also I. challenges, I must point out. Huh? I remember last time in Selangor, when we wanted to push Juan uh, mm. Aziza to be the Minitri Basar of Selangor, yeah. there was such a big controversy. The practice, we remember it well in the yeah. media. Yeah. 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 And even the uh, royalty uh, did not agree. Yeah. So that's why you know, it did not happen. Uh, but you know, uh, following up on that, um, and I remember that very well, <laughs> I, I, I personally think that also we have this situation where we are also, uh, in many cases, we're also bringing in uh, female um, candidates that might have, uh, might be a part of legacies, right? So Correct. they are linked to very strong male figures, for example. And I think breaking away from that pattern, not, uh, I understand that, you know, making it it's into a dominant politics. narrative. Yeah, yes. it's a dominant narrative. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, when we are able to see more candidates who are not part of these legacies, I think, you know, who are able to stand their grounds, who can say, hey, you know, I, I did it for myself on my own with the support. I've, I've gotten the attention of people. Then I think we're at a point where it's possible. But, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not, carefully optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the near Thank future. you very much for that, Vibhish Teresa and Dr. Villa. Um, Datuk Sri, what are your yes, thoughts? Yeah. Is Malaysia ready for a female prime minister? Uh, okay, uh, but uh, before that, uh, uh, I should uh, say that uh, uh, it should be not, not that, that uh, sometimes Islam is wrongly forced to bear responsibility for historical heritage that is alien to its nature. It is commonly known that sometimes custom and tradition supersede the religion in maintaining the life of uh, individual and society. Uh, in matters uh, concerning Muslim uh, women, the, uh, this phenomenon has uh, appeared in many aspects. So, uh, especially in uh, political leadership. So, I think uh, our scholars and uh, thinkers have to uh, review their uh, previous view concerning this matter, so uh, the uh, nation, women can have uh, the opportunity to exercise their ability to lead or uh, to be a leader. Because a Muslim uh, woman is not 
uh, prohibited by Sharia for exercising public job if she need to and if there is nothing that can spoil her conduct and chastity. Uh, some fuqaha or Muslim juries uh, have even mentioned that Muslim uh, women is obliged to specialize in a public uh, profession, uh, including leadership, political leadership, if required by the community. Uh, or, uh, so uh, a husband has no right to prevent his wife from going out to exercise a profession that uh, she is required to fulfill in the society as a fardu kifaya, we say fardu kifaya or collective uh, obligatory. Thank right. you. Thank you so much. Datuk Sri, that's a very fascinating insight. The fact that you say that a woman is actually beholden to serve the community if she's called upon. Very interesting, particularly as a perspective in a Muslim majority nation. Uh, Amira Aisha, is Malaysia ready for a female prime minister? Well, there's, <clears throat> there's a lot of nuance, I think, in order to answer that question. When you're looking at um, the female politicians that we have right now or the females that we have in politics, I think we're not short of people who are capable to do that. For example, you see uh, when Dr. Ottawan Azizah was um, the Timbalan tree, I think she did a splendid job, uh, YB Teresa Kok, YB Hena, and all these people have um, served in their duties excellently well. I think you can even say that they have served even better um, than you know um, some other men who have hold you know that, those positions. Um, and so, looking at the leaders that we have, we are definitely more than ready to have a prime minister of uh, a female prime minister. But looking at the views of society at large, I think. Um, Malaysians at large, uh, are we ready to accept a woman as a prime minister? I think there is still work that needed to be done on that front. And so as female leaders, I think it's very important um, for female leaders to be very responsible on whatever they say, on whatever they write, because whatever they say or write or their views can influence the people. And you do not want to um, say something or write something that can take our society back rather than forward. And so I echo that Dr. Villa and Wabi Teresa Kok, I think maybe in the near future, it is something that is inevitable. Um, but uh, we need to do a lot of work and we need to also be very careful with how we word things um, in order for us to inspire more women and inspire the society at large that women are not just born to be leaders, we should raise them to be leaders. Wonderful. Love that, Amira. All right, um, now Dr. Villa, let's talk core strategies mm -hmm. to increase female political leadership right. if we're really looking at making this happen within our lifetimes. You know, I'm going to jump off from what Amira just said. I think um, there needs to be a, a very uh, simple mantra that I think people, both men, women, institutions, organizations, political parties, need to constantly put at the forefront. It's about empowerment and agency. Mm -hmm. Are you allowing women to have decision-making positions, you know, to take on, to make decisions. You know, the power to make a decision is, is really powerful. And I'm not just talking about what, what am I going to have for lunch today, right? Or, you know, how am I going to sort of... Decision-making positions means that you are prepared for the eventuality of the decisions that you make and also knowing that people will support you, your team, mm -hmm. with people who you work with, family members will support you in decisions that you make. Making decisions is very difficult. And I think this is systemic. This is incredibly systemic. Uh, the way in which you ensure that somebody is in a position, in a leadership position at some point, to be able to make the right decisions for anything, right, policies or you know, how many people they, they attend to during a crisis and so on and so forth comes from very um, uh, important so, sort of training programs that start at a very young age. Mm -hmm. Are you going to say, and not just universities, high schools, maybe even primary schools, right? Sure. Are you teaching um, the girl child to essentially understand? They may not understand the structures, political structures that we have, but they do understand what it means to lead and what it means to take, um, to you know, to... To, to be in a position of power to help rather than govern, right? Or rather than control. And I think these are some 
very important uh, sort of um, um, uh, programs in which you give an opportunity for um, your female population to feel empowered, all right? And secondly, for them to reclaim agency. They may have come from families or communities where women don't make decisions, where they are passive. And suddenly you have an entire generation of girls and uh, uh, young women saying, we can make these decisions for our own communities, right? So empowerment and agency, a lot of programs have to run based on that. Mm. Definitely starts from the ground up itself. Now moving more into the specifically political spheres, um, YB Teresa, what are your recommendations for reducing barriers for women's entry into politics? Okay, first I would like to echo what Dr. Vila mentioned just now. I think it's uh, politics, okay, we have to understand what is politics. Politics means you... Uh, manage right, uh, uh, the society of the nation. So first we have to uh, let women feel that they have a big role to play in, uh, you know, in environment, in, uh, you know, in a caring you know, uh, ministry for the, for the society and uh, in politics and so on. They have the responsibility. I think this social political awareness is a must uh, to be imparted to women since young. Okay, number two is uh, removing the barriers, right? Um, I, that reminds me of my party, eh? Democratic Action Party. We started with uh, you know, amending the constitution, our party constitution, that uh, more than 10 years ago, we started to, have to, um, to create a women's affairs uh, position in every branch. Okay? We, we forced the branch, uh, all the branches, to fill in women member as the women affairs secretary. Do you know that when we started it, they, we, we then realized that there are uh, some branches in rural areas. They can't even find a woman <laughs> to they stand. Have to, yeah, to, to mm -hmm. just take that position. They got to put men's name. No? So we have to, the headquarters have to reject it, the uh, AGM, you know, the, the result. Ask them to do it again. No, by hook and by crook, you have to fill in a woman as a women's affairs secretary from the branch. Okay, secondly, is, uh, as you know, that we have amended our party uh, constitution that uh, in our party leadership, we call CEC, Central Executive Committee, uh, we must have 30% women uh, to be elected into the CEC. Um, we, we let the, member, uh, the delegates to elect 30, then no matter how the party have to feel, make sure we have 30%. Okay, then we see the backlash. You, you see the problem. You know what's the problem? When the delegates choose the uh, candidate, we then realized that because my party elections was a few months ago, many of them did not fill in women, uh, women's names you know, in the list. You know, because they say women will be appointed. Whether I put them in or not, and they are, there is so much competition among the men. So then in the end, that there are a number of these uh, delegates, they did not put in any women candidates because mm -hmm. they think that women will be appointed. So sometimes when we talk about a quota, when we talk about you know uh, appointing women into the uh, leadership, into the uh, in the lawmaker position, and so on, indirectly you also um, open in up these loopholes, right? Exactly. Yes. You, you do not allow women that to be recognized to be voted mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. by their votes. So, but anyway, I I must say that um, if we can start from the mindset uh, change, like uh, I mean, for my party now. Uh, those days in 1999, I was one of the first women MP. But if you look at our male, I mean, many of my party members are male, you know, are guys. They have no problem for us to, uh, you know, appoint women candidates in uh, come to general election. They also have no problem to elect women to be in the state chair, to be the state chairperson, uh, state leadership. So when, it, when we talk about mindset change, it's not only on... Uh, women, but also on men, on yeah. the society as yeah. a whole. So media mm -hmm. play a very important role, like Wachana, you know, today. <laughs> <Yeah>. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for that, YB Teresa. And of course, I'd love to ask the same question to Amira Aisha. What do you feel are some active steps that can be taken to reduce barriers for entry for women in politics? Yeah, well, when we're talking about entry, I think, again, it starts from um, the party itself, when women want to enter a specific political party. Um, 
Because when we're looking at election, for example, in general, uh, when you look at more conservative party, when we were establishing order, we look at the example of existing political parties and how they fill in candidates um, during election. And most of the time, they, they have this sort of like a um, system of quota where if you have 10 seats, for example, to be filled in, um, five of them will come from uh, the main wing. And then three will come from the youth wing and then two will come from the female wing. So from the very get-go, you can see that women are sort of squatted in that very small um, quota of being able to fill, to be fielded in as candidate in the very first place. And so that is why when we formed MUDA, we decided to take away those barriers and do not have wings whatsoever because we want everyone to be seen as equal in the party, regardless of your age, regardless of your religion, regardless of your gender. And so once we took off those barriers, um, then when we want to fill in candidates, we don't just look at whether there are males or females, whether they're youth, you look at them specifically based on their abilities to lead or their abilities to become uh, you know, a, a, represent, uh, a, 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 a parliament or parliamentarian or a state assembly person, for example. And so I think it is very important for you to have that shift of barriers in terms of the um, culture of politics in the first place. Uh, and also, you need to have some active effort by the members of the political, the existing political parties to scout for more capable female out there. There are lots of capable female leaders out there, but they don't see politics as something that they want to dedicate themselves to because it is very much a gentleman's club. And so you can't just sort of assume that I open a Google form and people will register, you know. Um, you need to have this active effort to go down on the ground and, and scout this, uh, these female leaders and give them political mentors uh, to feel, you know, to be, to feel, to relate to and bring them into the political uh, leadership as well. And once, once you have this in place in terms of your uh, party itself, then only we can discuss whether or not, um, you know, uh, we can have more uh, female leaders in parliament and in, in state assemblies. And this shift, I think, um, it's much easier to be done in terms of uh, systemic shift. It's much easier to be done. And I mean, in terms of the organizational shift, it's much easier to be done than the cultural shift. And so you need to have an active effort to do that cultural shift. Um, and it cannot be done later. It has to be done now. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Amira. And as we move towards closing the entire discussion, I would just like to ask uh, Datuk Sri one last question. Um, so to end on a positive note, Datuk Sri, your thoughts on how uh, very quickly having more female political leaders will be good and for the benefit of Malaysia in the next five to ten years. Datuk Sri? Yeah, yeah, no, no doubt, always. No doubt. <laughs> so uh, in this uh, conclusion, I dare to say that uh, uh, women's going out to work uh, and to exercise uh, their leadership uh, not forbidden in Islam for, for some women used to go out to work in the Prophet's uh, lifetime and he did not uh, disapprove of, of them. So that's uh, I think uh, enough for my uh, conclusion of my views on this uh, issue. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that, Datuk Sri. Yeah. We absolutely wish we had more time to dig even deeper, but I think our panelists have all been very clear and absolutely unequivocal in their viewpoints. The fact of the matter is that, of course, women aren't just born to be leaders, but borrowing from what Amira Aisha said, women ought to also be raised up as leaders and empowered by the wider community because capable women not just help uplift themselves, but also they're the men in society and the whole of society. That's all for Wachana English. I'm Tamina Kausji signing off. Have a wonderful weekend ahead. We'll see you again next round.